Good afternoon. My name is Rita Marsh, and I am with the Center for Human Flourishing in Carbondale, Colorado. I'm so grateful to be with you this afternoon to present an approach to health that I think you'll find very interesting. This is the work of Dr. Elliot Dasher, Integral Health, The Path to Human Flourishing. And today, I wanted to give you some information about Dr. Dasher's model and how it can be applied to the situation we find ourselves in with COVID-19 virus. And I'm hoping that all of you who are watching out there are feeling well and are interested in learning more about how you can self-manage your health during these times. So just to give you a little background, the Center for Human Flourishing is a nonprofit organization in Carbondale, Colorado. We've been in existence since, since 2003. And in 2008, we adapted the integral health model of Dr. Elliot Dasher that was presented in his book, Integral Health, The Path to Human Flourishing. And we did this because we found Elliot's work to be comprehensive and all-encompassing of the human condition. Dr. Dasher had taken the very complex model of human development uh, as presented by Ken Wilbur and applied it to medicine, to health. His ultimate goal was to see if medicine in this country, perhaps in the Western world, could transform and become a more holistic, a more person-centered um, method of care. And in some places, I'm sure that is happening. But our organization focuses on experiential education and we bring programs by teachers, authors, practitioners, that hopefully give people tools that they can apply to their life to create a more holistic sense of well being. Mm -hmm. I'll be sharing with you some slides today that were developed by Dr. Dasher, and I'll be explaining about the integral health model and giving you some ideas guiding you with some questions about how this model can perhaps help you through these difficult times we're experiencing with so many people challenged with the COVID-19 virus. I'm thrilled to be here today and part of the Unity Earth uh, Up Convergence Peace Weekend activities. We recently hosted the Caravan for Unity here in our community and had uh, incredible collaboration from community members and from the team of the Caravan of mm -hmm. Unity that came here and the remote team in Canada of uh, Hubcast Media. So still feeling in the throes of that, I'm sitting here today pulling together this presentation kind of at the last moment, but I hope that you'll find it um, helpful for you and uh, can, can uh, gain some things that will help to guide you, your family members, to look at health in a very holistic manner and um, come to the realization that health really is from the ground up. It's um, what we feed our bodies that um, make an incredible difference in the state of health that we experience. So I, I digress. <laughs> I want to tell you um, that Elliot Dasher, the author of the book, Integral Health, The Path to Human Flourishing, 
He practiced internal medicine for 21 years, and then he began an intensive study of Eastern philosophy, psychology, and meditation practices among the Western wisdom traditions of Asia. He's a past fellow of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. He's been on the editorial board of the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine and a frequent speaker at conferences. He's currently teaching an Eastern approach to health and healing with an emphasis on meditation, on the expansion of consciousness and the understanding of the depth of well-being that resides within us as human beings on this planet. He also serves as a personal mentor and consultant to individuals who are seeking a broad-based integral health. And his books and blogs and mentoring services can be seen on his website, elliottdasher.org. That's E-L-L-I-O-T-T-D-A-C-H-E-R.org. Dr. Dasher's other books, um, Whole Healing, a Step-by-Step -step Program to Reclaim Your Power to Heal, Intentional Healing, a Step-by-Step -step Guide to the Mind-Body Healing System, and most recently, Aware, Awake, Alive, a Contemporary Guide to the Ancient Science of Integral Health and Human Flourishing. So what is integral health? Well, as Elliot explains it, it's the expansion of health and healing process to address the entire range of human experience, biological or a physical aspect, psycho-spiritual, relational, interpersonal aspect, cultural slash worldly. These are four quadrants of the integral health model that you'll be seeing more in uh, the slides I'll be presenting. So all aspects, these four aspects, are seen to contribute to the disease process and to health and healing. The expansion of consciousness rather than the medical toolkit is a central approach. And I'm going to repeat that. The expansion of consciousness rather than the medical toolkit is a central approach. The aim is a whole person flourishing that can develop and sustain itself throughout the life cycle, irrespective of the presence or absence of disease. The integral approach will lead you to a more profound, precious, and enduring level of health, mm. happiness, and wholeness. So the terms to become used to, one's going to um, take this model as a map for exploring your current state of health and perhaps in making some changes to expand your sense of wellness, well-being. Integral health is self-generated and self-cultivated. It leads to a comprehensive, holistic, and far-reaching healing of body, mind, and spirit that's immune to life's adversities, including disease, aging, and death. Authentic happiness arises from within, is expansive, robust, passionate, and unaffected by the circumstances of daily life. Another term you'll hear in the discussion that I'm presenting today is genuine wholeness. Genuine wholeness is that that experiences the interconnection of all life, a seamless existence, uninterrupted oneness that is accompanied by ease, universal loving kindness, and a lightness of being. And human flourishing it's a profound, hearty, and sustained health, happiness, wholeness, and inner peace. And if there's anything that we long for and 
hope to gain in these days is a sense of sustained health, happiness, mm. wholeness, and inner peace. So I'm going to do um, screen share here and um, share a few slides with you. see. So integral health is an evolving health and healing. And we can be in places in our life where we feel we're just in the survival mode. And um, we go and receive treatment for whatever ails us, or whatever disease has shown up. And then we want to move mm -hmm. into a place in our lives where we really actively learn to prevent illness. And certainly with COVID-19, we've been given lots of advice about how we can prevent um, getting this infection, washing hands, staying away from crowded places, social distancing, wearing masks. Those are certainly the things that the CDC has said are important for us to prevent getting infection. And then we can move to health promotion. What are those things I can actively do to boost my immune system, to promote wellness, well-being in my life? And by example, sharing that with my family members and with people in my community promoting health through actively seeking um, partners in co-creating mm -hmm. well-being in my life and human flourishing. And I'll just say again, the definition of human flourishing, the ultimate place of feeling at peace with oneself, where we're experiencing a profound hearty and sustained health, happiness, wholeness, and inner peace. Let me see about um, encouraging this slide to advance here. Um, Oop, it just needed an extra click. So there we go. Okay, now this is the scope of integral health. As I explained, there are four quadrants, four areas of health we'll be looking at. And outer aspect of health is that which shows up in the world, the biological health, my physical being as I present myself in the world. And worldly is the aspect of work in the world that I do, uh, social activism and generativity. And you'll hear more about those terms in a little bit. But that's how I show up in the world through my physical aspect, the work I do, my activity and community with social activism and generativity, giving back to others. And the inner aspect of my being has to do with the mm -hmm. psycho-spiritual aspect, my mind, spirit, how I am evolving in consciousness throughout my lifetime. And interpersonal, my relationship with self first and foremost, then relationship with family, with community members, and others out into the world. In order to have relationship with others, it's so important that I realize that relationship with self is first and foremost. So outer aspect of my being, the physical aspect, how I show up in the world with work, with social activism and giving back to others and 
my capacity to do that because I've grown in consciousness and understanding of my own emotional balance or imbalances and I've been able to create relationship with myself first and foremost with my family members with my beloveds and with my community so those are the four quadrants of integral health and this really is a, a comprehensive integral health and each quadrant has a growth of um, consciousness, a growth of understanding, a growth mm -hmm. of complexity as we advance in life. And we'll take first the biological aspect of health. We begin with our anatomical body, the sheer miracle that an egg and a sperm have come together and begin to create cells that form a zygote and within the mother's womb over a period of nine months, an anatomical body grows and becomes more complex in its growth through the physiological aspects that happen biochemical aspects and also the genetic body that's incorporated in this evolution of a human being. And then we have the mind body of this biological being. This physical body has a mind, which I find as I grow, shows up in how the cells uh, behave. And then we have a plastic body, which is another evolution of the body and into subtle body, the highest evolution of a person's physical being. In the psycho-spiritual aspect, we begin with an, um, a growth in consciousness of first and foremost, the ordinary mind. And then as one takes on practice of meditative uh, contemplation, we begin to realize we have a witnessing mind, a mind that is able to look at our reactions, our behaviors, and, and begin to see relationship between how we're thinking about ourselves and how we act out in the world. The witnessing mind gives us the capacity to do that. And then we realize beyond that, there is a subtle mind. And that subtle mind is a place of quiet contemplation, uh, a place where there is um, one begins to realize that we're not just a drop of water, we're part of this bigger ocean of consciousness and then we evolve into transcendent mind of beginning to realize that there is a, a, a global oneness mind mm -hmm. and as our consciousness expands we can begin to feel ourselves in in the soup of all that is and then we come to the place of choiceless awareness and then one would call that the place of the Christ mind or the Buddha mind. And then as we look in this lower quadrant, in the interpersonal aspect of our health, as we're born and into our first few years of life, we realize there, there's an I. I am... Uh, a living being and I respond to the world around me and and then I then I begin to realize there's an us there's myself my parents my loved ones around us and and I see oh there's more than just I there's us and then I can evolve to the understanding there's all of us we're all involved in this um, relational 
growing um, journey of being human beings on the planet Earth. And there's all of us involved in this. And then I begin to realize there's interbeing, where I am intricately involved in the beingness of another human being, interbeing. And then at the ultimate growth of this interpersonal aspect of development, there's a realization of one, that we are all one. Now in the worldly aspect, uh, Elliot has explained that these are development levels one would go through um, as one was seeking to regain health or investigate health when um, you are challenged with an illness or a disease. So at first level, they're eclectic mm. healers. There's different um, com complementary um, and traditional healers, family practitioners, um, medical people in our community. Uh, and then there are biomedical centers where there's a more complex level mm -hmm. of care being mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. orchestrated. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then there are integrative mm -hmm. healing centers where mm -hmm. both mm -hmm. complementary mm -hmm. uh, Eastern mm -hmm. methods mm -hmm. of healing mm -hmm. come in interplay mm -hmm. with Western methods mm -hmm. of healing. So mm -hmm. integrative healing centers. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. what Elliot calls the centers mm -hmm for human flourishing. And he has a chapter in his book, um, Integral Health, The Path to Human Flourishing, about a center for human flourishing, which actually finds its roots in the Asclepian temple tradition of Greece, and a very interesting history of the temples of healing that were dedicated to the uh, Greek god of healing, Asclepius. But that's for another time. Uh, if you're interested in learning about Centers for Healing Flourishing, you can go to Dr. Dasher's website and he has an essay, this specific chapter from his book that you can read. And that's the model that we hold in our hearts here at the Center for Human Flourishing in Carbondale, Colorado. Um, we've gathered a community of practitioners that uh, we are holding as a network of resources for our community. And though we don't have a physical space for the center as yet, we do have the capacity to connect people with um, resources that can emulate the Center for Human Flourishing. So in an integral practice, what are the core components? First of all, there's the integral map, and you've seen the four quadrants, and there are lines of development in each of those quadra quadrants that will uh, look at very briefly in this presentation. There's the aspect of in introspection and contemplation, and that's both on the part of a client or a patient and on the part of the practitioner that they're engaged with. The capacity to look deeply into life situations through all of the aspects, biological, psycho-spiritual, interpersonal, and worldly, to see what is showing up as a causative factor in a person's dilemma. There's the defining of practices um, and having specialists who are willing to work together and uh, align together in the best interests of a patient or a client. 
There's the researching and choosing of practitioners that can support a healing journey or a journey toward health and human flourishing. Then there's beginning the journey. And that has to do with making a clear commitment to oneself, one's family, one's relationships, that yes, health is the most important thing to me at this time so I can continue to be a thriving member of my community and be available to those I love. And then there's the monitoring of progress. And with introspection and contemplation again, and with consults with your partners on the journey to monitor the progress and reassess and adjust as is needed. So those are the core components of an integral health practice using the integral map as mm. the guide on the journey. And then there's the integral relationship when the vision is an integral vision, when an individual is open and available, when the practitioner, he or himself or herself is in a self -transform transformative process. And this is a key, key aspect of this integral relationship that the practitioner must be committed in a self-transformative process and willing to partner with a client or a patient in such a relationship. Mm. When this, these three things are in place, the relationship then becomes the platform for an integral healing. And I know that so much of what the news reports today is that um, with the challenges of the COVID virus and with the healthcare system being overwhelmed with need from patients with clients, that the time for creating such relationships could be a very, very challenging thing to be happening in these days. But my hope is that we will have a breather from the impact of the virus and we'll be able to look at this integral relationship as a means of creating a pathway for health and well-being, a path for human flourishing for people in our community and in many other communities around the globe. So the integral practice is really a relationship between an individual and the practitioner. And it's a sacred we. It's the capacity of both the individual and the practitioner to come into relationship with the ultimate goal being the alleviation of suffering and the promotion of human flourishing. And again, Human flourishing is a profound, hearty, and sustained health, happiness, wholeness, and inner peace. I'm going to skip a couple of slides here. Um, so the larger integral community that we're looking at and is so in our face today is that relationship between the human experience, the environment, and the planet, the Gaia herself. These are so largely interrelated and it's so up in our face right now with challenges from the environment, with the wildfires here, in our country in the West, with the storms coming up from the Atlantic and into the Gulf, 
and with the concern of the planet with global warming, um, there are so many things that are up uh, in this larger integral community. And we really have to uh, make a decision personally about how we can interact in this triad. And so the first place, of course, comes to home. How can I, as one human being, take care of myself in such a way that I can be a player to support the environment and to support the planet? Oop, doesn't want to advance. So I'm just going to let's see. Stop the screen share now. And um, I'm going to give you some information about exploring the four quadrants that we looked at previously. Um, the quadrants of biological flourishing, psycho-spiritual flourishing, interpersonal flourishing, and worldly. So in the um, biological flourishing, the three lines of development that the integral model lies li lays out for us is the nutrition, the second is fitness, and the third is self-regulation. Nutrition has to do with eating nutrition, nutritious, wholesome meals. Mm. And we're beginning to realize that plant-based lifestyle has been proven to raise immunity and decrease inflammation and can assist people in reversing chronic health issues such as heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, other inflammatory diseases. And as we realize that a lot of people who've been uh, severely affected by the COVID-19 virus are those folks who do suffer from chronic illness. So I think more and more attention is going to come to supporting people eating organically grown whole foods and creating for themselves a mostly plant-based lifestyle. Mm. It's important to be choosing foods that are known to support your immune system. And of course, staying well hydrated with pure water and avoiding dehydrating liquids such as coffee or other caffeinated beverages and alcohol um, so that the body, which we're 85, 87% water, stays well hydrated and cells are healthy and can um, create an environment where viruses have a difficulty finding their way in. So nutritious, wholesome meals and recommending a plant-based lifestyle on the most part, like Dr. Dean Orish and uh, Dr. Esselstyn and others are, have been recommending for a number of years. We're so fortunate here in our valley to have uh, a lot of local farmers who have CSAs available to us. We have farmers markets. And this year we have a, an amazing program of helping people start their backyard gardens. So uh, there is an abundance right now of wonderful, wholesome, organically grown foods. Another line of development in the biological flourishing is fitness and the importance of getting outside every day for a walk is the most simple way to create a level of fitness that is uh, beneficial for you, 20, 30 minute walk. Uh, a stretching exercise 
such as yoga, um, centering exercises such as Tai Chi or Qigong two or three times a week, an aerobic exercise of your choice that raises your heart rate within the range for your age. And there, if you go online, you can find resources such as at the Hopkins uh, medicine.org where you put in your age and it gives you your optimum heart rate that you should be sustaining while you're doing aerobic exercise. A walking meditation. Um, there's a meditative poem from Thich Nhat Hanh to say to yourself as you walk slowly and mindfully, regulating your steps to your breathing. Breathing in, I calm my body. Breathing out, I smile. Dwelling in the present moment. I know that this is the only moment. So those four simple lines adapted to a walking meditation can give you both a contemplative practice and um, form of exercise. The third line of development in this biological flourishing is self-regulation. So being able to create balance in choosing and establishing a food, exercise, rest, sleep pattern that supports homeostasis, that self-regulating process by which the biological systems of your body can maintain stability and being able to adjust to conditions that are optimal for survival. It's self-regulation is a challenge for many people, especially when we're living in distressed times. And it really takes um, a will power and a trust that taking a path of choosing, exercise, food choices, rest, sleep balance, is going to create a platform for good health and flourishing for me and to create a pattern in such a way it becomes a habit and to disengage from habits that may not be leading to that place of good health and human flourishing. We know by the challenges of COVID-19 that our immune system functioning is one of the most important things that we can support during these times. And we know that it gets compromised uh, when the body mind is out of balance. So bringing balance into one's life is essential. And if you can find a partner who will take this path with you and commit to making changes that may be necessary in order to self-regulate and create that balance of good food, exercise, rest, and sleep. Um, that's the thing to do now. So those are the areas of biological flourishing I want to mention today. Next, we'll look at the quadrant of psycho-spiritual flourishing. And there's um, three aspects of this quadrant. And I'm going to say the words um, of these three aspects. The first is emotional growth and well being, the second is cognitive growth, and the third is cognitive, which may be a word that we might not be familiar with. But first of all, emotional, the capacity to assess your general emotional state and such questions you might ask yourself are, what motivates my emotional state? Am I reactive 
Am I motivated by anger, by fear, by uncontrolled desires? Am I more inclined to have swings between afflictive emotions and transient pleasure? Or am I operating from a state of stable and expansive happiness? Where am I on this spectrum? And where might I want to focus to create change so I do realize the capacity to operate from a state of stable and expansive happiness? In the cognitive line, stages here progress from reactive conditioned self-protective patterns to a reasoning cognition that seeks a larger truth, meaning, purpose, and fulfillment, and then to the most subtle level that arrives at that awareness that all is one. So discerning reliable information sources on the best way and means mm-hmm. to respond to the concerns about the virus transmission and following the guidance of exports expert sources is certainly the first step in developing and maintaining a responsive versus reactive state in these days of challenge. And practices that support present moment awareness are especially helpful. Meditation, yoga, tai chi, qigong, walking meditation, being able to practice a level of awareness where I am present to now and move away from old patterns of reactive conditioned self-protective patterns that have caused me to harm myself. Then the cognitive line of development What is the source and the character of my motivations? Am I responding to the situation from a fearful stance, from instinctual reactive stance, or from vision and values that have been established in my culture, education, religion, that are based in a place of wisdom, wholeness, a sense of oneness, with the qualities of loving kindness and compassion. What is my purpose in this life? What are the motivating factors? Am I responding from a place of wisdom, wholeness, a sense of oneness? Or is it instinctual and reactive? The source and character of my motivations And this takes some deep introspection and often some guidance from um, a counselor or a person of trust where you can begin to explore these areas and realize that the more I come to understand I am one with a larger energy, with a larger being in my role as a person on this planet, then I can respond with the qualities of loving kindness and compassion to things that arise in my life. So here's um, the psycho-spiritual aspect of our beingness is really a very, very important um, quadrant as we looked at the integral health model. And it really takes attention to take time each day to pause and check in and say, how am I feeling? What am I saying? What what is my tone of voice? What is my body language expressing? Do these expressions of emotion place me in a category of the reactive mode of fear and anger, or am I swinging between effective emotions and transient pleasure? 
one of the things that is very easy to do to bring one's emotional mm -hmm. state into balance is a sequence of 10 deep breaths a practice to bring you into a peaceful, compassionate state. You'll find that taking purposeful breaths allows your mind to rest between each breath. And there's a heart coherence practice from HeartMath Institute. That's another very easy centering practice. And if you'd like to join me, we could do this now. So uh, sit comfortably in your chair and focus your attention on the area of your heart, the area in the center of your chest. And as you focus on the area of your heart, imagine that your breath is flowing in and out through this area. And as you continue to breathe through the area of your heart, recall a positive feeling, a time when you felt good inside and bring that feeling to mind and feel it expand into your heart area. It could be feeling appreciation for the good things in your life or the love and the care you feel for someone. So bring that with your breath Bring that positive feeling through the area of your heart. Those are the three simple steps. Focus your attention on your heart. Then breathing into the heart area, letting your breath flow in and out. and then bring up a positive feeling, a feel good inside feeling, and experience that flowing through your heart. And the next step is to take this simple technique and make it a habit. You can do this by picking certain times of day when you give yourself three to five minutes just to focus on your heart. When you wake up in the morning or right before lunch, just before bed, waiting in line at the grocery store is a good place to practice this. And you'll be amazed how different your experience of waiting in that line can be. More information about the heart coherence exercise can be found at the HeartMath Institute, and that is heartmath.org. And um, they have many resources to help create uh, heart coherence and this sense of feeling well being and emotional balance. Another way to create emotional well-being is the practice of gratefulness. Journaling each morning or evening about the things you're grateful for can help build an emotional muscle or being able to operate from a state of stable and expansive happiness. Another practice is a loving kindness meditation. And you can go online and uh, just put in loving kindness meditation and you'll find many resources that can guide you in this practice. And that's another uh, very simple emotional stabilizer. So making any of these practices 
part of your daily habit can make a huge shift in your emotional sense of well-being. And the next uh, quadrant that we'll look at in um, human flourishing is the interpersonal flourishing. And there are three lines of development here, personal, family, and community relationships. So questions you can ask yourself as you assess the interpersonal flourishing. On the personal level, am I taking care of myself in all aspects as expressed in the integral health model? Biological, psycho-spiritual, interpersonal, and worldly. Am I paying attention to myself and taking care of myself in all these aspects? Am I feeling in right relationship with myself and thus prepared to be a reliable support for family members, for community members, as I'm requested or as needed? Then relationship with family, especially at this time where we've been in shut down, shut in, uh, family communications connect become challenging. And so I must ask myself, am I listening to my family members? Am I pausing and really hearing what they're saying? Do I hear the tone in their voice of concern? Am I <clears throat> paying, <clears throat> paying attention to that? Am I receiving their concerns and needs in a way that's responsive and not reactive? Am I willing to allow their response to be theirs and not try to change it or mitigate it unless there's a concern that the response is detrimental to their health or well being? Am I not hovering and saying, change this, change that, or saying, you shouldn't respond that way? I wouldn't do that. But just being present and listening and hearing their concern and their response to the situation. And then in the broader community, am I listening to the needs and concerns and desires of community members? Am I ready to respond? Have I been taking care of myself and creating a balance in my life so that I am available for family members? Where can I be most helpful in supporting a community response to this situation without moving into a fearful reaction and disenfranchising, disenfranchising behaviors? Am I aware that my personal choices affect the economic well-being of businesses in my community. So many businesses have been shut down um, and had to change their way of practice. How can I support them to thrive and survive? Um, ordering takeout food from restaurants is, is one thing I know that um, we can participate in. Um, how do my personal choices affect the economic well-being of the businesses of my community? And do I look to shop locally versus having ship things shipped in? Am I looking around to see those businesses or individuals who have been uh, challenged and, and not thriving during this time? And how can I be of support? Prudently making choices to support businesses that rely on income from public attendance, such as movies, concerts, churches, workshops, etc., with um, regulations uh, keeping public gatherings at a minimum. How else can I support these businesses so that 
um, rely on being able to have people gather and um, how can I promote their virtual events so that they still get a stream of attention coming their way. Those are just some of the things that I could think about as I look at how can I support my community during this time. The fourth quadrant that Dr. Dasher calls worldly, there are three lines of development here. One is the work I do in the world. The second is social activism. And the third is generativity. Efforts made to teach others what I've learned in life is um, a, the, what the term generativity means. So to work in the world, I could ask myself, does my profession or my past profession or life experiences place me in a position to help in my workplace or volunteer in an organization that needs support? How might I step forward to assist? So many people have been regulated to no work at this time. How can I be of support to these people and help them realize there is hope that at the other side of this um, restrictions, regulations around the virus, there will be work for them again. There will be a, a place in the world where they will feel they have purpose. Their life does have meaning. If I was at this place of being regulated to no work, how is it affecting me emotionally, financially? This um, shutdown that had people mm -hmm. regulated to non-essential workers, I know was very, very challenging for many in our community. What is a person's sense of self-worth that they're being categorized as non-essential? So how can I support a person to find essential work and meaning in their life so that they can realize their value and their contribution to community? The second line of development here under worldly is social activism. Where is my time and energy most needed during these unfolding months? Can I be most supportive and effectual at a neighborhood level, at a community level, a national level, or beyond? Where does my life experience through the years fit in where I can put a voice, put some put money, put time and energy to a place that is going to make the, and ease the societal burdens that have been caused by the virus? Where are my is my voice, my expertise, my actions best applied in this situation? Those are just some questions you can be asking yourself and remembering that extending yourself out into the world is not absolutely necessary. The most important thing is that you're caring for yourself, your close family members, your neighbors, and as you're feeling stronger and more balanced and more secure in your sense of well being and your sense of happiness and human flourishing, then you can reach out and be effective in the areas of social activism and generativity. These are the efforts made to teach others what we've learned in life. Perhaps. The offering you have is to demonstrate a steady state of compassionate emotional response toward yourself and all others. 
that you communicate with during this time. Perhaps that's the simplest, most precious thing that you can provide is a steady state of compassionate emotional response toward yourself and others. Perhaps it's helping a neighbor with their children so that you can get some respite and feel that she has time for self-care. Perhaps it's helping with homeschooling of children who aren't able to be go back and attend to school helping in your neighborhood in that way. Efforts to teach others what we've learned in life. That's the aspect of generativity. So we're very quickly taking you through the four quadrants of the integral health model with some ideas about what you can do for yourself, first and foremost to be able to feel a sense of profound, hearty, and sustained health, happiness, wholeness, and inner peace. And I'm just going to reiterate what the integral health model brings to us is a map for creating a wheel of balance, mind, body, and spirit during these times, but any other time in life. And it really can lead to a path of being aware that authentic happiness arises from within. And it can be expansive, robust, passionate, and unaffected by circumstances of daily life. And integral health is self-generated. It's my responsibility to generate this health for myself by partnering with practitioners and with uh, support people I know that can help me on my path. It's self-cultivated. I have to do this work myself. And it's not work when one eases into the habit of taking care of biological, psycho-spiritual, interpersonal, and worldly aspects of being. And it can lead to a comprehensive, holistic, and far-reaching healing of the body, mind, and spirit that is immune to life's adversities including mm. disease, aging, and death. That's the promise of this path, integral health and human flourishing. And um, for those who are interested in learning more, there will be a series of classes coming up in virtual um, on the virtual world screen uh, about the integral health model. And we'll be um, presenting those from the Center for Human Flourishing here in Carbondale, Colorado. And um, it's been a pleasure to reach out to you today to just give you a glimpse into the model and in the future, I'll be explaining more how you can use this map and apply it for your life and for the lives of your loved ones. So as um, Dr. Dasher has um, said in his book um, that the achievements of integral health, authentic happiness, and genuine wholeness will bring us toward the highest and best that is possible for each of us. By reaching toward human flourishing, we become co-creators mm -hmm. in the next evolutionary leap of health and healing. 
we continuously create more and better health for ourselves and for our world. Nothing less will do if we are to fulfill our human destiny. Um, there is um, a short story from the beginning of Elliot's book I'd like to share with you before we close today. And the name of the chapter is This Precious Life. Imagine being taken on a special voyage to a treasure island. But at the end of your stay, you're unable to see the abundance of jewels everywhere on the island. So you, you depart empty handed. How sad and disappointing that would be. Yet, that is too often the unfortunate fate of your life. We live blindly among unimaginable treasures. And at the end of our days, we leave unaware of the great wealth and the great health that has always been right in front of us. So the guidance of the integral health model will <clears throat> help you realize the abundance of jewels that are everywhere on this island of Gaia and in your life and to start by realizing something as simple and yet profound as being born into a human life is the most precious thing that can happen to any person. To be born and live as a human is a precious and rare treasure. And so to nurture it through the path of integral health and human flourishing is my invitation to you. You can reach our organization at the website www.davinikent davinikent.org. Davinikent is Ute language. They were the first people here in these lands of Colorado. And so we asked for a name that would mean a reconnection to spirit. And the Ute elder, mm -hmm. Clifford Duncan, gave us the sounds, Davinikent. The literal translation is always light. A reconnection to spirit, to our guidance from the essence of all that is one, is a mm. promise of the integral health model. Please join us again for other presentations, and hopefully you've enjoyed the upconvergence and all the programs that have been offered, and that you're ready to move into Peace Weekend and all the activities in New York City that are happening through the Caravan of Unity 2020 and the people from Unity Earth, the Sign Network. It's been a pleasure being with you today and uh, hope to see you again. Thanks a lot.